Okay, so first I, I want to start with um, uh, a book that I, I, I found very intriguing and compelling, written by a father uh, of a child with autism, and he happens to be a novelist, so obviously really good uh, ability to, uh, to write and, and compel the reader. And his novel is um, about his son's autism, and it's called Not Even Wrong, uh, Adventures in Autism. And uh, in, in this novel, he, he has some really interesting uh, quotes, so I, I'd like to share them with you. And one is, to know autism is to know the mystery of what it means to be human. You know, some of you may think, well, this is a, a little bit of an overstatement, but actually, it's very reminiscent uh, to me of some of the um, ideas that um, developmental psychologists were sort of thinking uh, a, a few decades ago when they were doing research work on how children develop. One in particular, a legend, Uri Bronfenbrenner, who we still uh, consider... Um, uh, an incredible developmental psychologist and who helped shape ideas of how children develop and, and the multiple sort of layers and levels of influence on child development. And he wrote very similarly, children need people in order to become human beings. So I think if you take these two quotes together, you can have an idea of um, actually how relevant um, Paul Collins quote is in terms of autism because if children with autism are not taking advantage of people around them uh, especially meaningful, meaningful people in their lives then they're really missing out on the human experience um, which is fundamentally social. So what's interesting is that the book's title and, and I found this out and I thought it was really quite uh, quite interesting, um, that it's based on a phrase that was used by uh, Wolfgang Pauli, who happened to be a theoretical physicist, and he, he would use this phrase, you're not even wrong, uh, to put down his colleagues. <laughs> yeah, I, I'd like to use it on my husband, actually. <laughs> You know, English is a second language for him, so it would kind of pass. <laughs> he wouldn't know I was insulting him. Um, and <laughs> and he, so he'd use it to say, you know, you're so off target, you're not even wrong. Like, it's completely <laughs> irrelevant. <laughs> so um, Paul Collins applies this phrase to people with autism, uh, I think not in a demeaning way, obviously, but in a, in a sense that... Um, their perceptions and their ideas and, and the answers that they give in response to questions cannot be considered neither right or wrong because they sort of have a different frame of reference, a different fra framework that they're working within. Uh, and I thought this was really um, quite a nice way to put it. And he, he quotes in, in his novel, he says, only a person working from the same shared set of expectations could give a wrong answer. And I think he's right. Uh, if, you know, if an alien came from another planet and, you know, had to sort of make sense of what we're, we're doing, we wouldn't uh, fault that individual for not understanding because you have to kind of be in the context and understand the context to really answer questions um, accordingly. So he says the autist is working on a different problem with a different set of parameters and so they are not even wrong. Um, and the reason I, I show you this quote is because I, I think in terms of our perspective on autism, it fits really nicely in the sense that we believe that, um, at least this is our working sort of hypothesis, is that there are genetic, biological, neurological processes that in typical children prime them to learn within their social context. But in children with ASD, it actually limits their ability to engage in the learning interactions in this, to the same extent. Um, and so what, we're, what we're, we suspect is happening is that there's different attentional and perceptual attunement to the environment. And that coupled with a lack of experience over time and a lack of skill development over time, this is 
becomes kind of snowballs uh, in a variety of different relational contexts. So the relation between the parent-child interaction early on in infancy, later in terms of peer relationships, uh, and even later in terms of teacher-child interactions, and so on, and so on, and so forth. Uh, and so we believe that the, this sort of developmental cycle just continues to widen the gap between children uh, with ASD and their typically developing peers. And so the way we think about it, if, if we start early from infancy, although we can't diagnose ASD in infancy right now, uh, is that we have this sort of idea of the parent-child interaction really early on being so fundamental, that attachment and that social uh, relation between the parent and the child, that the parent has to be sensitive and has a lot of responsibility uh, early on to uh, be attuned to the child, be aware of all the cues that the child is sending out alleviating distress, uh, uh, providing growth fostering uh, opportunities. But this relies a lot on what the child is also bringing into the interaction. And so if the child has clear cues, you can uh, understand and read what's going on, uh, facial expressions, um, uh, consistency of response, um, and has to be quite responsive and attuned to the parent. And so in the case of a child with autism, maybe the attunement isn't quite right and something is off in that, uh, in that cycle. And so actually a, a controversial uh, perspective right now is that it's not just that the child is coming into the world with maybe sort of differences neurologically and so on um, and is creating some difficulties in terms of sending out signals. Uh, the parents are having a hard time reading signals, but then um, uh, Lane Strathern has come out with this idea that, well, it's not just that, but it's also that the parents themselves might have some difficulty in being aware. So if, if, if you look at... Um, the parent responsibility here is being sensitive to cues, being attuned to the child, attentive, uh, promoting uh, growth up and, and alleviating distress and so on. So, in fact, she's suggesting it's not just the child, it's not just the challenge of what the child is bringing in, but it's also sometimes the parents because genetically we know that there's a broader phenotype of ASD and some parents and, and family members might share some of the characteristics um, of children with, with ASD. And so what she's suggesting is that this genetically sort of determined predisposition and the cumulative effects of exposure to adverse or atypical social environments, meaning that the family uh, situation or the, the parent-child situation might be a little different uh, uh, in, in reaction to that sort of um, uh, limitations from both the child and from the parent. And so this makes you think back to a scary time when, you know, we used to call parents of children with autism refrigerator uh, mothers and so on. And actually, Kenner uh, had a similar sort of perspective that the patient, he thought, endowed with an innate disability to relate to people is further influenced adversely by the parent's emotional detachment. Now, you know, I know of anecdotal information uh, of, of people that I've um, worked with where the parent is actually incredibly socially capable and competent and the child is still quite challenged. So obviously we have to take this with a grain of salt, but it's something to consider in that we have to keep our, mi our minds open to the possibility that we're dealing with not just uh, an issue with the child, but an issue with the child's environment as well. Just before I get into attention and perception research, because I know not everyone is sort of oriented to this um, area of research, I just want to define a few terms really quickly. So when we talk about sensation, we talk about simple sensory experiences. So, uh, you know, the light on your retina, okay? The sensation of light on your retina, and that creates signals to the brain. That simple sensations. Then when we talk about attention, we're talking about the selection of sensory input, where you're actually, here you are, you have buzzing, you know, environment of all kinds of stimulation coming at you, 
how do you decide what to focus on? And so attention is what helps you to actually decide what you're going to focus on and process more deeply while ignoring everything else. You actually have to keep other information at bay, otherwise you'll be overwhelmed. Um, perception is defined as uh, the organization and construction uh, of associations from sensory input. So you actually start to, um, because we are actively involved in understanding things as human beings, we have to make sense of information around us. Um, we're always in the process of picking up uh, consistencies, inconsistencies, uh, relationships between one thing and another. And so perception is the way that we make sense of this sensory input. And it involves attending to things uh, and focusing on things and learning. And then when we talk about specifically social perception, we're talking about then how do we make sense and construct meaning from social stimuli. And things that are social typically involve other people and involve uh, uh, cues to other people, like from our face, from facial expressions, from our eye gaze. So that's how do we interpret and make sense of that kind of information. How does this all fit within the, the current <coughs> diagnostic criteria for autism, or ASD, I should say? Um, we know that there are three core areas of impairment in the DSM and the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders. One is that children with ASD have this impairment in social interaction. Um, so they have difficulty with reciprocal interaction with others. They also have impairments in both verbal and nonverbal communication. And they have this restricted sort of narrow interests, repetitive and stereotype patterns of behavior. And so where does attention and perception fit here? Um, and of course it has to be uh, onset before age three. It's not a brain injury, uh, something that happens later in life, but it's something that presumably you're born with or, or presumably you know, uh, interacts with the environment over time and you see a developmental progression of the condition. Um, well, right now, obviously diagnostically you can't say, oh this child has a particular attention problem therefore uh, they have ASD or a particular perception uh, profile and they have ASD. We're certainly not there yet and I don't know if, if we'll ever be there. But it does have implications for understanding certain aspects of, of the condition. So for example, it could explain narrow and restricted interests. So there's been some research to look at uh, maybe the enhanced perception that some of these individuals have and how it might be related to uh, them having a very narrow uh, interest in specific objects, and I'll talk more about that later. It could also explain poor social ability in the social reciprocity uh, area in that they do have diminished attention to faces and social cues, and that in some ways could explain developmentally, if you think about that accumulating over time, could explain how they develop poor social skills or certain aspects of their social functioning. But it also has the potential to connect the triad, which some researchers have said, give up on that, there's no way you're going to ever connect this triad or have a grand theory of autism because autism might be caused by different things. So there could be different types of autism um, and they could be caused by different things. However, it we still have to keep it open that it's possible that they are, these impairments are connected and for example, uh, social ability, communication and narrow interests could be connected if you think about the sensory and perceptual system as being the foundation to pretty much everything that comes after it, right? So that is how we first process information and you need those fundamentals like the structure, like the foundation of a building and then everything else builds on that. Okay, so in some ways it can connect but obviously we're far from that. Um, so now to just give you an idea of how some of, of these um, 
attentional and perceptual um, issues come up really early in development and how they might progress over time that would give us a hint about what's different in autism. Okay, So we know that early sensory experiences and attentional biases help infants orient to what's relevant. Okay, So they're coming um, they're in the womb and they have very limited sensory experience. They have some, right? We know that infants have some experience with sounds, right? So when they're in the womb, they can hear the mother's voice, very muffled, obviously, but they can hear the mother's voice and uh, they can hear music and actually remember music that they heard while in the womb. So they've done all these really interesting experiments um, to find out just how much infants know even before, you know, before they're born, right? Um, they have relatively less visual experience. Um, and uh, we, as humans, rely a lot on visual experience. Um, but in the womb, it's dark and wet, <laughs> so there's not a lot of visual experience that you're going to get. However, um, we know that even as early as uh, four months, a uh, fetus of four months can have some reaction to light changes. So if the mum is out in the sun versus the mum is inside in a dark room, so you, they actually have looked at orientations to and away from light. So there is some limited experience even with visual information. So the, this experience provides a little bit of guidance about who to listen to, but not a lot about who to look to, right? So they, they have no idea who, who, who would be important uh, and meaningful to look at. But we know that at birth, children, ha infants, have this bias to face-like configurations. So they don't know what a face is, okay? But they have some kind of attentional bias. They look more at configurations that look like faces. Okay, so dots, for example, that are configured uh, that sort of look like a face, and even dots that are scrambled up, look like a scrambled, like a Picasso face, are more appealing to infants than uh, a boring square pattern or, you know, uh, other types of patterns. So somehow, they come into the world with this bias toward this meaningful social uh, stimuli. And so how do we know this? Well, a lot of, you, you can't really ask an infant. So a lot of the researchers, what they do is they design these preferential looking paradigms and they present two uh, very different types of st stimuli and then they uh, look to see where is the uh, infant orienting to and looking at longer, how long do they look there, and then when do they get bored of it, when do they turn and look to something else, et cetera, et cetera. So, Obviously, there's a little bit of leeway there for, for some error or, you know, a little jump in, in terms of um, uh, speculating what's going on in, in the mind of a child. But they're, they've been done for a very long time, very controlled and, and in, in different uh, types of um, uh, research contexts. So we can, we can be sort of confident that we, we can trust this kind of data. And what we, we found over time is that human faces obviously are attractive in a multimodal sense. Uh, so it, it makes sense that they're attractive because they have, um, first of all, we know that the, the configuration of the way the eyes are here, the nose is here, the mouth is here, and the roundness and so on is appealing to infants. But then we know that obviously the, the parent voice is already something that they're also attuned to. So children, infants prefer to listen to a parent's voice or a human voice over a non-human sound, again, at birth. So, so again, this idea that somehow they're primed to pay attention to meaningful social information. So auditorially, it's captivating as well. Then there's the preference for human animation. Again, uh, infants are drawn to human movements over non-human movements, okay? So the movement of the mouth, the movement of the face, et cetera, is also captivating. Um, and the face can also be manipulated. The infant can touch it and manipulate it. 
But even more interesting than that is it's very interactive, right? So the parent is constantly interacting and responding to the child and what the child does, and then the child responds back to the parent and gets a response back. And there's this constant cycle happening, which makes that experience very rewarding. So the experience with faces, first of all, is they've got lots of exposure to faces. They, it's very interactive and responsive, and it's very rewarding. Okay, so it's got everything going for it. It's a very I interesting experience for the infant. So what we think is happening is that the bias that they come into the world with in terms of attending to uh, faces and social information, along with the experience that they get over and over again and lots of practice, develops their skill of paying attention and, and recognizing faces and recognizing emotions and uh, looking to see where people are looking and, and, and how that's important. So the social salience becomes really high for these kinds of cues. But we also know that this, so not, not everything happens at birth, and we know that this is something that unfolds over time, so it's not like it's a given that you come into the world and you're going to be interested in faces uh, necessarily, or you're going to want to continue to be engaged with faces, because what we found out is that actually more finer detailed information about faces and distinguishing facial features, distinguishing emotions, uh, these are all things that happen over time. Okay, So it takes quite a bit of time uh, to actually get really good and refined uh, at interpreting faces and the information from faces. And actually some information from faces uh, doesn't happen, you, you don't get really, really good at it until late adolescence uh, uh, and into adulthood. And even some adults are better than other adults at interpreting. So it's an ongoing skill development thing. Who can recognize this face? <laughs> Anybody not recognize it? So you, you think, oh, well, anybody could recognize that this is Stephen Harper because we've seen Stephen Harper so many, so many times and we have certain feelings about Stephen Harper. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, well, and, you know, more or less attractive to some of us. Um, but the point is that it seems like it's a pretty ubiquitous kind of uh, skill, right? Everybody can recognize this face. So what's so special about that? Well, actually, if you look at how um, people become experts at identifying objects in, in the environment, for example, bird watchers or dog breed experts, um, you know, people who are so fascinated with dogs that they can tell you exactly what kind of breed this particular dog is, where they come from, how they, you know, all kinds of details. That's kind of the equivalent of, of what we're doing when we're ad identifying specific individuals like Stephen Harper. So it is quite a feat, but we don't recognize it as such because most human beings can do it very easily. And of course, if you you know add distraction or the face changes in any way, we can still see that it's Stephen Harper. It doesn't affect us all that much. So why the question that we've been asking, and you know other researchers who, who study these kinds of um, uh, issues about social uh, attention and social perception is why are faces not captivating for children with ASD? Now that I've told you all the reasons why they are so captivating and so interesting, why is it that for children with ASD and, and actually even adults uh, for, with ASD are not so captivated or interested in faces? Well, some of the ideas that have been floating around are that it, it's possible that they're just not attending to it. Uh, you know, so we're asking the question, are they actually attending to it uh, or are they attending it to it differently than typical, uh, de typically developing individuals? Uh, or is it is not a question of attention, but is it a question of how they organize and perceive it? Are they just not perceiving it the same way we do, uh, doing it differently, uh, you know, what's going on at the perceptual level? Or is it that it's less rewarding or somehow distressing 
so these are some of the ideas that have been put out there. Um, it could be that they're just, it, it makes them so anxious or they're just distressed by it somehow. Um, or that just more neutrally, it's just not rewarding enough to look at. Um, or do they have a preference rather than for faces, which most typically developing infants do, do they have a preference for objects in their environment? And that's taking up most of their attention and that's where their bias is. So these are all questions that are still up in the air that we're, we're, we're looking at. And there are some clues to answer these questions from the research on social and non-social attention in, in ASD. And some of the things that we found are um, that they are attending less to the eye region uh, of the face and more to the mouth region of the face than most typically developing people. So they, they seem to have a different pattern of attending to the face. So it's not that they don't attend to it at all, but they have a different pattern of attending to it. We've also sort of figured out that conceptually, the understanding of eye gaze direction, why is where someone else looking is looking so important? And why do we automatically look to where someone else is looking? So if one of you were to orient your gaze to the door, a good majority of us would also orient our, our gaze to the door just because we are compelled to look where other people are looking. Like it's something important. That's, there's some important information there that we have to attend to. And people with autism can turn it on or turn it off. It seems like it's not as compelling for them um, to turn uh, where other people are looking. Um, they're also less accurate at determine, determining mental states from pictures of faces. So if you show them a face and you say, okay, what is this person thinking? What are they feeling? They're, they're not as good as typically developing individuals at figuring that out. So somehow they're not taking all the information that's there and interpreting it to make sense of a social problem, right? Well, what is this person thinking? What are they um, uh, feeling? And, but when they do get it right, they're actually using the same information we use. So they do pay attention to the eyes to make sense uh, of you know, what this person is thinking or feeling uh, when they do get it right. In the non-social attention area of research, we found that actually they have a preference for local processing. So instead of uh, most of us, what we do when we see an image is we, we do a big kind of gist look at it. And we, we kind of forget the details because they're, they take up uh, effort and we don't need to look at the details. We just kind of need to figure out the gist. Uh, well, people with autism actually have a preference to look at the details. And sometimes it works in their benefit, but most of the time for social tasks, it works against them. Um, the other thing that they have some difficulty with is modulating attention. So when you have a task of paying attention, you have to be both aware of you know, things that happen right away, so a sound or a, a visual input like a, a lightning flash or something, uh, but you also have to be aware that you, you have another task, you have to attend to me and what I'm saying. So you modulate, you decide, okay, how much am I, attention am I going to put at you know, random events, like the door slamming over there, and how much attention am I going to put to understanding what I'm saying, right? So this modulation of attention, uh, which is called you know, bottom-up and top-down modulation, is not working as well. The other thing that we figured out is actually they have enhanced, really very good abilities to do visual search. Uh, and what that means is that they're attending, they're scanning uh, the visual field and catching uh, targets much quicker than their typically developing peers. And so this brings a, up a question in our mind is if they're really good at this and they're uh, somehow enhanced compared to the rest of us, what effect, what impact does that have on their perception? Some of the interesting lines of research that I'll, I'll just quickly tell you about is um, they're starting to do more what's called computer modeling of attention. And these computer, computer models are like models of learning. So they try to figure out how do children, how do infants learn things, right? How do they make sense of all this 
barrage of sensory information that comes in. And they test hypotheses with these models that they build. So uh, in, in one study, they compared the end states of four neural networks. And they had learned to distinguish between a set of stimuli. So this was, they had a task, and they had built these models to learn how to distinguish between a certain set of stimuli. And what they found, there was one particular model that best fit the sort of uh, behavioral profile of people with autism. And what they found was that it was an early attention shifting impairment, meaning that they weren't consistently shifting attention uh, at the right time, and combined with a familiarity preference. So when they were, uh, they preferred familiar stimuli rather than novel stimuli, stimuli that they would tend to orient to uh, those that were preferred, it, that were familiar to them, that this seemed to uh, result in the commonly found sort of features of enhanced discrimination and restricted interests in children with ASD. So again, trying to figure out how do, how do we come to have this kind of pr uh, pr learning profile that individuals with autism have with these models of how attention works. So some, some interesting developments in, in that area. And one of the other things that have been important in the research that's been found is that there's been so many mixed results about, you know, children with autism actually do as well as typically developing children or adults, um, do as well as typically developing adults uh, on some tasks. And so it's confusing. How come they're doing well on some tasks when you'd expect them to do poorly, and yet on other tasks they do poorly? And, well, what's going on? It's just a, a, a mixed bag. And what we found, if, if you sort of scour the literature, what, the, what seems to come out is that there are advantageous conditions for typical face processing in ASD. And that means that they're not always doing well on this task, but when they do well, these are the conditions. It's got to be a static picture, so no interference from other sense modalities, so auditory or uh, movement or you know other other uh, cues that actually make it more difficult. So if it's a static picture, if they have more time to process the picture, if they have no distractors in the periphery, so if it's just my face and not you know things around me, so if the snapshot is just of my face. Um, under these conditions, they show more typical patterns of attending to faces and, interestingly enough, more typical brain activity uh, patterns to what typical individuals have when they look at a face. Of course, there's lots of diversity within the ASD group, and so some individuals with ASD are actually doing uh, well or poorly even under these conditions and some of them do well even under more dynamic and multimodal conditions. So there's, there's this great diversity um, and of course there's also variability in social motivation and learning. That's a big piece which we often don't consider in some of this cognitive research is that the motivation to learn, the social interest, the social awareness, social motivation is a huge part of this learning which often is not accounted for uh, in these kinds of studies. We know a little bit about how they're attending and perceiving things differently um, with regard to social information like faces. But now there's this idea, if we think about how we become experts at face processing, that we know that there's, there are people who become experts at objects. So not only are humans you know, capable of becoming face experts, but we also can become experts at recognizing objects, like what I mentioned earlier, uh, you know, dog breeds or um, for example, car, different models of cars, uh, bird watchers who know different species of birds, et cetera, et cetera. So there are these subsets uh, uh, of, the, of our population that bec become experts at objects. And we know that there's been lots of studies to find out how they become experts at processing objects. So one of the things that we know 
about children with ASD is that they're actually maybe not so captivated by faces as a group I'm talking about, but they are captivated by certain objects and very much so. So we know that obsessive and restricted interest in objects is actually a defining feature of ASD. And it's estimated that 75% of these children actively pursue, collect, and engage with these objects quite, uh, quite vividly, right? <laughs> so they get really, um, they're quite attached, actually. I'm sure, Pat, you have lots of stories <laughs> of how attached these kids can get to these, these objects, right? And so it's a defining feature. We know there's been lots of, uh, you know, anecdotal, clinical, educational evidence about how engaged they are with these objects. And actually, you can use it as a reward system and so on and so forth. And in the DSM-4, it actually, well, actually, the tool that we use more specifically, the autism diagnostic interview, there's a question about the extent of the impairment. How much does that interest interfere with the family life and their social activities? And in some cases, it's quite severe that they are almost exclusively engaged with these objects and not really all that interested in social uh, initiatives or uh, even family life. So it can be quite intense. So the idea then is that this object perception and recognition in these individuals can actually be better than their face perception. So if that's the case, and there's been very little evidence, but there is some evidence that this is the case. There's actually one interesting study where they looked at, uh, uh, I think it was an adolescent or a young, uh, an older child with ASD who had uh, an intense interest in Digimon characters. And they did brain imaging on, on him and they studied his uh, perceptual abilities with these Digimon. And in fact, he was a real expert at recognizing these Digimon characters. And his brain activity looked like he was processing these Digimon characters like they were faces, like we would process faces. Okay, so he, he did have a perceptual expertise with these objects. So let me give you an example of perceptual exper expertise. Can you name this dinosaur? Who knows? Very good, some dinosaur enthusiasts. Well, that was an easy one. What about, what about this one? Who's, who had a? A what? <laughs> uh, no. Any other guesses? A Lamasaurus. <laughs> I had no idea. I, I certainly, but so you can see that. I mean, and there's so many different types that if you if you are not interested or really involved, you know, in the learning of these, you would have no idea. You'd say this is a dinosaur, right? So. Some of these kids, and, and actually some typical kids, are so interested, or they go through these phases where they're so interested in these types of objects that they can tell you exactly what the name of each of these dinosaurs. Um, and so that's an example of perceptual expertise. Here's another example. And this requires intense training, right? So, so uh, uh, you know, when you, when you go to your... Um, your uh, ultrasound technician, okay? I know, I'm sorry, that it's a very bad quality, but I'm, I'm just not good at um, making it better. The ultrasound technician can tell you, can everybody see it? Um, can tell you the sex of, of the fetus, right? Really, actually, quite early on in, in, in the development of the fetus. And um, any, any guesses as to the sex? You have a 50-50 chance. <laughs> okay, let's forget. But, but ultrasound technicians, and that's not all they can identify, right? They, do, they need intense training. And then they, they become so good that they immediately can spot, you know, something like this uh, on a, an ultrasound that looks like a blob to any one of us, right? So here, does that help? <laughs> 
So you can see they did a little bit of an outline here with the feet and the legs and the genitalia. Do you oh, see it? it Do you see it? Yeah. It's really hard. I, I mean, I would have no clue, and most of us would have no clue, except unless you've had intense training on how to uh, understand what you're seeing, right? So th this kind of perceptual expertise, which we have for faces, requires intense training um, if you're going to apply it to objects, okay? And so what we're thinking is maybe these children with ASD are actually so engaged and so motivated and so rewarded by um, some of these objects and maybe they have a perceptual and attentional bias toward these objects that what they're doing is they're actually um, processing these objects like they would process faces and on the flip side they might be processing faces like they process objects. Okay, so if we were to process faces like we process objects, this is what we'd be looking at. Anybody have an idea who this is? Okay, you guys are too good. <laughs> yeah, that's George Bush, all right. But it's, it's much harder if, if you're only given a part of the face, it really is hard to identify who that person is. Um, so this is not how we process faces. We have to have the whole uh, configural uh, uh, image and, and we, we do it more on a global level rather than on a parts-based level. Whereas when we look at objects, we process them on a parts-based way. But if you become an expert, then you can see it more globally, the way we do faces. So. Some of the promising uh, methodologies and, and research uh, coming out now um, involves taking advantage of the genetic heritability of ASD. Because we know it's highly heritable, what we can do is we can look at infant siblings who are at high risk of a later diagnosis. We can look at unaffected siblings and their parents to maybe understand the broader phenotype of ASD. Um, and there's also a lot of interesting work starting to come out on just examining autistic traits in the general population to see the ones in the general population who score really high on the AQ, which is a measure of autistic traits, um, do those individuals share some of the same sort of uh, perceptual or attentional uh, tendencies that people with ASD show? And one interesting study, uh, very new actually in 2011, just published, is that face and object perception is heritable. So you are as good as your family members <laughs> at processing faces and processing objects. So if you happen to be born in a family where you know people are good at recognizing faces, even if they've seen faces just once a long time ago, you can see the person again and you immediately know who that person is. Or if you have all these, if, if it runs in your family, then chances are you know, you're, you're going to be good at this. Whereas if you're the type of person who, you know, and, and, and it sort of runs in your family where uh, you can't tell who this person is, even if you've met them a couple of times, right? So these kinds of things seem to run in families. So, and they found that parents of children with ASD, like their children, have poor memory for faces and they have better object recognition than face recognition. So this is an interesting study, sort of supporting some of these ideas uh, about the dichotomy here. Then, of course, um, the baby sibs uh, studies where they look at the siblings of uh, the children with ASD who are at much higher risk of developing ASD. So you can see how it develops prospectively um, even before the diagnosis is given. Uh, have recently shown some interesting findings in that ASD, at least for now, we're assuming, maybe we don't have the measures to know what it is early on that is different about these individuals, but so far it seems that they're not really all that different, at least for the first six months of their lives, and that it seems like it, ASD is kind of developing um, 
this sort of social communicative difficulties that we then continue to see later on in development and then which provides behavioral evidence for a diagnosis. So this lack of shared eye contact, the smiling, the communicative babbling, these are things that don't seem to be a problem early on but then start to become gradually more and more uh, problematic. I'm sorry, are, are these in children that develop ASD? Later, yes. How do you mean they develop it later? Well, because uh, what happens is there's a much higher rate of ASD in families that already have a child with ASD. Mm -hmm. So if you track, for example, the, a mom gets pregnant, right? They already have a child with ASD and a mom gets pregnant and then has her baby. You can track that baby over time and chances are higher. I mean, obviously not 100% that that child will develop ASD, but the chances are higher that that child may also develop ASD. Oh, and so okay, but the development look. would be the same. They would still have had it from birth and get yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Symptoms yeah. Don't it's, show up. The yeah. symptoms don't yeah. show up. Yeah, so yeah. here they're talking about the symptoms. See, there doesn't seem to be anything distinguishing them early up to mm -hmm. six months. Um, I don't know, Pat, have you heard anything? It, it seems like up to six months, there, maybe we just don't have the tools to figure it out. Maybe there are differences, we just can't see them. But uh, after six months and then slowly into the first year, you start to see the symptoms when they do actually develop ASD. The difference is that the SIBs are monitored. Yes, yeah. that's right. Um, the other uh, interesting uh, finding in, in this area is um, uh, Jerry Dawson and, and her, her group, um, Sarah Webb and, and colleagues here, looked at, it was a really extensive study, I, I don't know how they did it, um, <laughs> they had uh, 18 to 30 month olds um, who had either high symptoms of autism, low symptoms of autism, developmentally disabled children who didn't have autism, uh, siblings of children with autism, and siblings of children, uh, of other children who don't have autism. So they had an incredible set of, uh, of toddlers uh, to compare. And what they found were, was that um, you were, they were experiencing, the ones who had it more severe social and communication symptoms showed slowing in face uh, processing or learning. Okay, and they use this habituation paradigm. So it's a, a sort of a different kind of paradigm than the pre preferential looking paradigm, but it, it, it indicates, it's an index of how fast an infant is learning the image of the face, right? And they found that these toddlers who were severe in terms of their social and communication symptoms, not the lower, not the ones with the lower symptoms uh, in social and communication, but the ones with the high symptoms in social and communication had this slower face learning. Um, and, and this wasn't the case for other uh, individuals who had develop, general developmental delay, like intellectually handicapped children. And they also found, interestingly enough, that the siblings of the children with ASD also took longer to habituate to faces. So they were also a little slower as well. Uh, but interestingly enough, they were the siblings of the children with ASD, but not the children who had lower symptoms of ASD. So it seems like something is running in families here um, in terms of how they're processing faces. And so here's an example of the, the images that they used. So they, they compared how they processed houses as well as faces to see you know, what the difference was. And they had no problems with processing faces, uh, houses um, as quickly as their typically developing uh, peers, but they did have difficulty processing the faces. So in, in the article, it goes on to say why they thought that this slowed habituation to face learning is happening in ASD. And they thought that it could be a bias to attend to the individual features of the face. Uh, so a certain perceptual style that they had, a, an attentional style that led to a certain perceptual uh, experience. And that in these toddlers, uh, relative to the other groups of toddlers, 
uh, they, they, who tended to process faces more holistically, these toddlers might be processing them more in a parts-based, sort of local way. Uh, another interesting study, now more in, in terms of the finer details of the face, the emotion processing or uh, making sense of emotions from faces. This one study looked at how adults uh, process emotion from faces and if that's still at, a, at an adult age related to their social adaptation. So, because you would think over the years they would compensate and learn how to, you know, sort of make sense of uh, uh, faces and so on. But actually they did find an association between facial processing accuracy and social adaptation in adults with intellectual disabilities with and without autism. Uh, I'm sorry, they didn't find it in both, but they looked at both. And what they found was that the ASD group alone scored sig significantly lower on both the emotion and non-emotion facial processing tasks. So not just the emotions of the faces, but generally the face was, was still very difficult for them to process. And um, in further analyses, they did uh, hierarchical regression. They showed that the association between the facial emotion processing accuracy and the level of social adaptation was statistically uh, significant. So that it, somehow this was predicting how poorly they were doing socially. Um, and um, another really interesting study I came across, which kind of shows you the practicality of all this, is that this one uh, group uh, decided, you know, it might be interesting to look at driving, because that's an issue for independence in, in this population, right? Can they drive? Can they go out there and, you know, be more independent? And they found that, for example, social attention and adaptive functioning um, was, was related. So perceiving driving hazards using social and non-social cues. So sometimes the driving hazard has to do with something that happens on the road that has nothing to do with a human being, right? Other times it has to do with other people on the road and how they're driving. And what they asked was the participants with ASD to, identi to identify these driving hazards compared to their typical uh, peers. And they found that the ones with ASD identified fewer social hazards than their comparison group, uh, but not non-social hazards. So they were perfectly fine at figuring out when something was wrong and it had nothing to do with a human being. But when it had something to do with a human being, then they weren't as, as good. Um, and they were also generally slower to respond than their comparison. I assume these were in simulation experiments. Oh, <laughs> yes, that's right. Yeah, I hope. <laughs> um, so, so what they, they concluded was that people with a ASD can perceive driving hazards, so their perception is, is intact. However, when it relates specifically to social cues like difficulty that, uh, um, identifying when other people are involved in driving hazards, <coughs> then it becomes a problem. So you're talking about like noticing a person in a crosswalk? Yes, yeah, so things, or, or another driver who's doing something, yeah, the erratic or, or not, uh, yeah, exactly. <clears throat> but can they see them as an object if they are in the car driving? They can see the object as an object instead? Yeah, it's not clear. They didn't go into detail about the causes of this. It's it's more they just observed that this was the the way that they responded to. But we don't know what exactly they're they're doing in those circumstances. Are there because a lot of driving? I think if you think about some of the things, actually everything we do involves sign of predicting what other people are doing, right? Trying to figure out, you know, when, when I cross the, the street, I'm always looking at the, uh, I make eye contact with the driver to make sure that they've seen me, they know I'm crossing the street, you know. Uh, I think driving, like many other human activities, requires, you know, social processing. You have to make, you have to make sense of what other people are doing, their intentions, and, you know, and so maybe that's, that's specifically where, where they have the problem.
Okay, so the research challenge then to understand the link between perception and social competence uh, is like, what is this link? It seems so far removed, but in some ways I think we're starting to see a connection. Um, is that, well, the challenge that we have is that social and non-social information in the world is presented in sort of a multi-sensory, very... Um, uh, dynamic, always changing, loaded, you know, with social complexity, things are happening fast. So this is the real world. But when we take individuals into our labs and we try to study these very real world, dynamic, interesting, complex things, we have to start breaking things down to a point maybe where they become meaningless uh, in the grander scheme of things of, in terms of how things happen in the real world. So in some ways what we have to do is we do have to break it down to try to make sense of it and understand it in an experimentally controlled way, but then we have to put it back in, in, in the real world context and say, okay, well then let's, let's start connecting these things that we know of these individual aspects of processing and how they are uh, connected together in, in a real world sort of more ecologically valid context. And, and that's our challenge and it's very difficult because I think a lot of us are still at the breaking down stage and it's very hard for us then to put it together and say, okay, now how do we make sense of this when it all comes together, right? It, well, it, it, there's just so many dimensions, right? So many different levels. There's the moving aspect, there's the time aspect, there's the multimodal aspect, different senses, different, there's the complexity. It's just so much that a lot of us just get overwhelmed. <laughs> <laughs> and it's easier to, to study like compartmentalized you know, aspects of it. Um, but the challenge is we have to do that because if, if it's going to make sense in the real world and if it's going to have real world applications to you know, either intervention or strategies, educational strategies, then we have to take what we know at this very basic level and bring it into a more... Uh, informative, you know, ecologically valid context. So some of the, the research that we're trying to do is um, we're trying to examine these components of what makes up social competence. So how, how do children become socially competent uh, despite the fact that we actually don't formally teach it? We don't formally teach children how to become socially competent, how to process faces, how to process social cues, how to uh, pay attention to you know, what other people are thinking and, and feeling. A very little formal training in that. But yet children become, and some of them, extremely able uh, to the point where they can even manipulate <laughs> others to get their way, right? Um, so what we're trying to do is we're trying to... Uh, sort of break it down to look at the, the various components of it, you know, the social attention component, uh, the perceptual components, the cognitive components, like what is due to, um, uh, you know, making sense of the, the sort of intellectual aspect of it, um, and, and then, uh, you know, more at, at a, a more um, higher order level, how does this all come together uh, to, to create this, this competence? So, and one of uh, my students is actually working on um, even just a measurement of, we have so few measures of social competence, of uh, actually understanding how do we measure it? How do we know how much somebody has and how much somebody's lacking? Because people, people with ASD have, are all over the spectrum. And so actually in the typical population, there's such variability on how good somebody is socially or how poor somebody is socially. Um, so we don't even have very good tools to measure it. Um, and we're, we're also trying to ex explore and improve methods to increase social competence, um, either through individual instruction or social conditions that provide more opportunities for social engagement between uh, children with ASD and their peers, um, and exploring the connection between social competence and then identity development um, and mental health. This is a real huge issue in the, in the population of, of ASD because uh, the more socially isolated and the more 
uh, narrow and focused and um, I guess uh, segregated from the rest of the community these individuals get, the more likely they will develop mental health problems. And that's a real serious condition that can actually be worse, I think much worse than ASD. Okay, so some of the things that we're trying to look at is, um, uh, if you remember, I, I, I told you about how this population of children seems to be much more uh, able to search uh, and scan their visual image to find targets compared to, and we believe that this has something to do with their perceptual skills. And so what we're trying to do is we're trying to look to see can we find these enhanced perceptual abilities in these kids and, and then connect it, how is it connected to their social functioning. So here's an example for a, a kind of task where if you ask, you know, can you locate the red X? If you look at this visual uh, image, it pops out at you, right? You can see it, you don't even have to do a search. It's right there. You can see exactly where the red X is. But if I ask you, can you find the orange square on this other um, image, it's going to take you, to, you're going to have to scan it and it's going to take time. And the more elements are around, the longer it will take you. Well, with kids with autism, um, actually the more distractors there are, the better they are compared to typicals. So now it slows typicals down a lot but for people with ASD, it actually doesn't slow them down all that much. And they can quickly spot, you know, the... Was um... it intentional that it's in the exact same position? Sorry? Was it intentional that it's in the exact same position? Yeah, I'm just... This is an example. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, they vary. Uh, they vary. And it, it gets harder and harder. Yeah, this might be just beginning and then... Yeah. And so my student, Kimberly Armstrong, is looking at this um, enhanced visual search and the relation to social function uh, because it's, it's actually a quite a robust finding in many different labs in the UK, in the US, um, and now we've actually found uh, that this visual search superiority uh, is present in this population of kids with ASD. And we want to know, well, what's the relation here to their social functioning? And so she's doing a similar task, asking them to find a red X among um, other X's and T's of different colors. So they have to discriminate, discriminate between uh, two different colors and shapes uh, and find the, uh, the target. And so far, I think she's up a little further. I haven't talked to her in a while, but um, she had about 16 kids with ASD, um, all, all you know, in the average range uh, uh, in terms of intellectual functioning. And she's given them the IQ measure, the AQ, as a way of measuring their autistic traits, like how severe their um, their uh, autistic um, symptoms are. And of course, we, we do a diagnostic uh, confirmation of their diagnosis with the autism diagnostic interview. And so far, she's starting. She, I mean, she. It, we hope it, it will hold. I, I think it makes sense uh, that as we get more, we should see an even larger um, effect. But she is showing that the group with ASD has this. Uh, a superiority effect in terms of searching for these objects. And now what she wants to do, oh, sorry, what she wants to do is to look at the relationship between this and specific subdomains of the AQ to see how is it related to their symptoms. Um, so is it that the individuals who are doing really well at this are actually doing much more poorly socially or do they have much better attention to detail skills or so t just to see how how it's it's related to their uh, profile um, so again this is a very sort of compartmentalizing and saying okay we found this specific skill let's see how it's related and then from there we can build and say okay now that we know that this group of individuals has this skill what, what else can we find out about them and how else are they different and, and so on. Um, my um, postdoctoral fellow uh, Alina Birmingham is doing 
uh, an interesting study on emotion. So here, uh, a little bit more sort of fine grain uh, processing of the face, where you have to figure out what is the emotion the person is, is uh, expressing, and looking at the attentional strategies that uh, individuals are using. And she's using faces that are converted to grayscale and blurred with this Gaussian filter. So if you look at this face, you have no idea what this person's uh, facial expression is. But then if you use a, a mouse, a computer mouse, to navigate the face, uh, you'll see that the faces have one of, can people see the uh, various expressions, uh, scared, uh, grossed out for, for kids, meaning disgusted, uh, angry and happy. These are the most basic expressions you, you can think of. So very simple in terms of facial expressions just to see how are kids processing these faces in terms of uh, the attention strategies that they use. And so what she does is she gives them um, this on a computer screen and tells them um, what is the face feeling and use the mouse to navigate to figure out you know, what part you want to attend to because when the mouse uh, uh, moves, the, the little window moves on the face, it is a higher resolution and will show, and will show the face more clearly. And what she's... So it, un, it unblurs that part of the face. So it, te it will tell us where, where do kids go when you tell them, you know, what is this face feeling? Do they go to the mouth? Do they go to the eyes? Do they go to the, you know... And what we found, we did a, a developmental study first um, to see just typically what typical kids are doing. And uh, five and six-year-olds, seven and eight-year-olds, nine and ten-year-olds, and eleven and twelve-year-olds. And you can see from, it's probably not so clear, but um, these, thanks uh, Pat, Th this is uh, from eye tracking, um, uh, sorry, not from eye tracking, but from um, uh, analyses of regions of interest, so where where that individual is attending to, um, and if you see from early on, they're more patchy. So they they look at the eyes and they may look at the mouth and separately, right? As they get older, they start to, and especially here, this is where they become more accurate, and they start using more of the eyes and the, and the mouth and the sort of the, the, the center region of the face more integrated. These are typical. Yeah. So this is how the typical kids do it. So they seem to start off more patchy, okay, and you can see that actually a lot of emotions uh, requires looking at the mouth. Yeah. A lot of emotions, uh, uh, some emotions less, more, are more eyes, but a lot of these emotions require looking at the mouth. But as, as kids get older, they realize that actually, they're, and they're better, their performance is better, when they integrate both the eyes and the mouth together. Okay? Now what we're doing is we're looking, okay, now how do autistic kids do it? Um, oh, sorry, that, that's not. Um, how do autistic kids do it? at the same ages, okay? So we're gonna look at these kids at the same ages. How are they attending? Are they doing it differently? And the preliminarily, she has not, uh, does anybody remember how many? Krista, do you know how many kids she's collected so far? Yeah, so we don't have enough yet, but she, she was telling me that it's looking like they, are doing similar things, but they're slower. It's taking them much longer to get uh, this kind of pattern happening. So maybe we might find a delay, or we might find actually that we, as we collect more uh, uh, participants with ASD, that we might find that actually they might be doing something very different. But we're not we're not sure yet. Um, so my, my doctoral student, Jody Yeager, is developing this measure of social competence, which we hope will, will be uh, quite useful to measure the variety of social difficulties that we see within the spectrum. Because obviously they don't all have the same social problems. Um, and if we can get a sense 
of the the different sort of quality of social problems that you have in in different individuals, we can be more we can tailor the intervention or tailor our strategies to that individual's uh, social uh, style, if you will. Um, so she's called her her scale the multi-dimensional social competence scale. And it's a primary, it's a caregiver uh, uh, form. So you a ask, ask the parent about the child, uh, which is the sort of easiest way to do it. Um, and it's a summated rating scale. And you have different domains um, that are assessed. Uh, social motivation, social inferencing, demonstrate, demonstrating empathic concern, social knowledge, verbal conversation skills, nonverbal sending skills, and emotion regulation. And this is based on a scour scouring of the literature that she did uh, from social psychology to cognitive psychology to uh, even um, uh, work in, in the uh, other uh, domains, for example, in, um, in organizational behavior where they talk a lot about you know, making sense of other people and, and social competence. So um, we're hoping it's going to be a, a useful tool. She's just in the process of analyzing all the items uh, now. Then Krista is interested, Krista Johnston is interested in looking at, um, and did her honors thesis actually, on looking at... Um, both static and dynamic images. So one would be a static picture and the other one would be an actual video clip um, to see w how uh, high functioning uh, young adolescents uh, process and what do they take out of this uh, scene, this social scene. So social cues and um, various interpretations of what's going on there and how good are they. Um, and now what I wanted to spend a little bit of time talking about is, okay, so here's all this research that is out there that we know about. We have some clues about what's going on attentionally and perceptually in these kids. Um, and now, you know, some of the research that we're trying to do in the lab to, to better understand these, these um, issues in these kids. But now how do we apply it? Like, what do we do with this information that we learn from our research? And how can we apply it to actually make a difference in these uh, individuals' lives? And one of the th uh, things that um, my, my colleague uh, Jim Tanaka is doing at UVic is he's got this really nice um, face camp uh, that he does every uh, summer. And he tries to, he's a basic scientist, he studies f how individuals process faces. He studies how people become experts at uh, face perception, at object perception. And what he wants to do is he wants to apply that knowledge and, and make a difference in, in kids' lives. And so he's, he started with this face camp a few years ago. And it's basically uh, a way to increase awareness and the importance of social attention and perception and uh, faces and how important face perception is to overall social uh, functioning. And he does um, a really nice job. I've heard a lot of good feedback about the kids. It, it, it's a lot of typical kids that go. There, there may be a few kids with uh, developmental disabilities, but not specifically for them at this point. And um, he does all kinds of really neat activities. Uh, he has a lot of great students, uh, volunteers, that do, um, they do arts and crafts with faces. They do uh, computer games with faces. Um, and they do all these activities around faces. And he also collects uh, data uh, uh, for his research on face perception. And uh, so one of the other things specifically that he's involved in is using his research knowledge on the development of expertise um, to design computer games to improve face processing. And he, he has one computer game, you can find it on his website, called Let's Face It. And um, it's, uh, he's already had some promising findings where he uses the motivation for computer games that a lot of kids have, that they're really motivated and focused on the computer and have an interest in that sort of modality. 
to uh, teach them about uh, perceptual expertise on faces. Uh, in particular, he's, he's done this with a group of um, children with ASD and has some preliminary findings that are promising in that uh, they do become better at recognizing uh, identity and emotion and so on if they practice and, and he has these um, various um, uh, games that they, they run through that help them to uh, break down what goes into uh, identifying faces and identifying emotions. So that's one of the ways that uh, this kind of research is helping to um, put th the evidence that we have into practice. Then the other thing that I, I think we should start doing, although it's a huge task, and Emily, uh, my student, is, is thinking about how we might do this, um, in terms of increasing opportunities for peer interactions and, and social development, because we know that kids with ASD are behind, you know, um, in com comparison to typically developing kids, not only because they come to the table with more difficulties and challenges, but also because they're excluded <coughs> of, often times because people just don't know how to relate to them, especially kids, right? Kids are really cruel. Uh, if, if you don't know what you're doing in the social domain, kids have no tolerance for you, right? Uh, adults have a lot of tolerance, some adults more than others, but kids have very little tolerance, especially if they don't understand you know, why you're different or uh, don't understand or don't know what to do. And so Emily's thinking, uh, how can I help uh, you know, the peers of children with ASD become more aware, more sensitive, uh, and actually maybe even teach them some things that they can do to engage the child with ASD to then help that child become more competent. Because competence, social competence is a two-way street. It's not just one person that is competent. The competence happens in the interaction. And if the other individual is more aware and more instructed and educated, then that interaction can be more successful and more socially competent. Um, the other thing that we'd like to do um, down the line is to study this perceptual interest more deeply and find out what is it about these kids who have this intense interest in objects? What's driving that? How are they different perceptually, attentionally, et cetera, et cetera? And can we use this in some way to help them in the social domain? Uh, is there something that we can do to bridge you know, their strengths in this perceptual sort of object uh, area to the face and social perception area. And so we'd like to be able to figure that out. But we're, we're just at the beginning of thinking of that. And so if anybody has ideas, <laughs> I'd be happy to take them. Um, and the last thing I want to end on is another quote. I'm a big fan of this book. <laughs> Paul Collins says, Autists are the ultimate square pegs, and the problem with pounding a square peg into a round hole is not that the hammering is hard, which it is, but it's that you're destroying the peg. And we always keep this in mind where we hope that we don't, that that's not our goal. We don't want to destroy the peg. We want to hopefully, you know, make the, the interaction, the match between the environment and the child more conducive. That's our goal. Yes? Just um, out of interest, actually. I, um, I was wondering if um, kids with autism, when they see faces of themselves in the mirror, um, if they show the same kind of interest or disinterest mm -hmm. that you see with faces of other people. Ah. Um, yeah, that's an interesting question. I, I don't know that a study has been done on that specifically. Um, I know that, are you aware of one? Yeah, there's um, a study that uh, involved putting a red dot on the child's nose. Oh, Do you remember that? it's yes, like an old, yes. old study. That's an old study for yeah. untypical. I know. Oh, yeah, we did it with our child and it was, uh, took him a very, very long time. 
to to, to identify yeah. that you know that that was yeah, that so somehow they're not recognizing that that's them in the mirror and that this is something on their yes. body, on their person, yes. right? Yeah, um, I think the idea theoretically, the 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 notion in developmental psychology is that you know a child learns a lot about themselves and their you know their identity, their self concept, their self esteem, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, from interactions with others, that we are an extremely social being and that we are, who we are is, is very much a product of the relationships and the interactions we have with others, which is why, you know, my, that initial quote I, I think is, is so profound because if children with autism are not able to engage with the rest of, of us, then they're missing out a huge part, in ter and it has all kinds of ramifications in terms of their own identity, in terms of their own concept, in terms of their own, even making sense of their own emotional states and emotion. If you look at young children, I mean, I, I actually have some toddlers and whatever, <laughs> for, what are they, are they toddlers still? Um, three and a half year old twins, and I have a little, uh, a little boy who's uh, almost two, and I remember clearly, because it's fresh in my mind, how, how much the reaction of you as a parent plays into how they respond to a situation, right? So if something's happening, and they did research on this, uh, if something's happening in the room and it's completely new, they've never seen it before, uh, you know, what do they do? They'll orient to the parent to, to figure out how is the parent responding to this new event, and then they'll either cry if they see that the parent is in distress, or they will be okay if they see that the parent is, you know, happy and, and fine and or you know. So they gauge a lot of how they're feeling through the parent, right? And especially as they get older, they become more and more in tune with what the parents are feeling and, and thinking and how they're feeling and thinking. And then so there's both uh, similarities in terms of integrating that, but also then you, you you can start to distinguish yourself from the other, right? Oh, I know my mom likes this dress, but I don't like that dress. <laughs> I'm going to wear this dress. You know, I have my daughter this morning. You know, it's like she insists on wearing this particular dress that she likes that is a summer dress, you know, mm -hmm. when it's winter time. And so, so the, you know, as they get older, they start to do, there, there's both a, an integration of, you know, what is my, the parent thinking and feeling to understand and make sense of things that they are new to them, but also they start to become confident in discriminating, you know, what they like and what they know and what they're thinking and feeling from yours. So it, it's kind of a dichotomy, but I think it happens together and it very much involves other people. Like, it just doesn't happen on its own. So I think in all those areas, uh, children with autism are at a disadvantage, I mean, definitely. Um, and one of my students is actually uh, starting to look at uh, self-identity development. As, uh, I think the reason I was asking is that, uh, I mean, human genetics, I'm saying, and most learning do a lot of research and observational learning, and practical learning, and that's what recently, um, some techniques that have been shown to work especially for younger kids are um, self-modeling so you show them rather than seeing somebody else do something they actually see themselves through video, video editing in the mm. form mm. and that has more um, beneficial effects because kids are interested in seeing themselves so obviously once you've got past a certain point where identity develops and they realize but they also develop efficacy and competence that's kind of associated with it and I, so sometimes the face is actually a distractor in, in learning motor skills anyway and so it's kind of interesting when you talk about positive benefits in, in autism, in learning motor skills, where you're not distracted by the face, but then there are other benefits in terms of seeing yourself reenact because of the kinds of feelings that you're able to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think that the, generally where we're coming to is that we're, we're realizing that actually uh, children with ASD have skills and talents actually that uh, they will outperform us in, in some domains, definitely. So the, that, that way of processing, that the style that they have is actually advantageous in certain situations. 
The problem is that it's not advantageous in what most of us do most of the time, which is social uh, mm -hmm. processing, right? So that's where they're at a disadvantage. And so if there was some way that we could even the field a little bit, you know, but I think we have to give some. We can't expect that the child is going to be manipulated and, you know, remediated in so many ways that, you know, they lose themselves and, and then that everybody, you know, they have to uh, shape themselves to the environment. We also, as a society, we have to make room for these kinds of differences and then there are benefits, I think, because they have a lot to offer. You know, we just have to find a way, it's a very tricky thing, but we have to find a way of balancing so that they can better navigate the social world, but also that the, the world can, can, yeah, can, it can help adjust uh, to them as well, you know.